All right, let's talk about biodiversity. What is it? How much? Is it overrated? Some people think so. A definition of, of biodiversity is the variety of life and all its many manifestations. Um, the downloadable book um, that I've recommended for you uh, defines it as the variability among living organisms from all sources, uh, terrestrial, marine, aquatic, microbial, ecological complexes, which are their part, includes the diversity within species, between species, and of ecosystems. Pretty complete. I'm not going to ask you to memorize it. Um, when we as scientists look at it, we look at it from an ecological standpoint, a genetic standpoint, and an organismal. It's more often, I think if what you've probably been exposed to through the media is, is organismal. But we have biogeographic realms, we have biomes, we have provinces, we have ecoregions, ecosystems, habitats. Organismal is more the number of different species, the number of different genus, the more number of different subspecies. And genetic is genetic diversity within a population. So, and all three are important. So let's start with genetic diversity. Um, encompasses the components of the genetic coding uh, that structures organisms, uh, different nucleotides, genes, chromosome structures between individuals within a population and between populations. And it's something that I'm going to give you some real world examples, some, one of which I was even involved in. Um, right now, we humans have completed the sequencing of 180 species, and there's only 1,750 genes for some bacteria, 300 for E. coli. Uh, and then you get into some of the larger, the mouse, 25,000 genes or more. Um, the number of chromosomes within a somatic cell can go from only two in a jumper ant to 1,260 for a fern. So. Uh, lots of chromosomes in that particular fern. Um, within a species, genetic diversity is commonly measured in terms of allelic diversity. Uh, the average number of alleles per locus, gene diversity, heterozy mainly heterozygosity, uh, and then nucleotide differences, um, and how that variation is differed among populations across a habitat um, and how animals are able to respond to changes in their environment, whether those changes are anthropogenic, which means human caused or natural. Um, so let's move into an example. I think that's usually the best way to, especially genetics. I taught it for four years. I know how tough it is to understand. Um, this is a a, a pretty cool study that was done on African elephants uh, and their taxonomy. Forest and savanna elephants are, um, were studied and, and they were used mitochondrial DNA. I'm hoping you remember the difference between mitochondrial DNA from the mitochondria and the nuclear DNA. And what they found is that there was very little difference. And, and so people thought, well, we could take forest elephants and put them in the savanna, or we can take savanna elephants and put them in the forest, and it won't be uh, much of a concern. Uh, so the mitochondrial DNA did not resolve the taxonomy at all. It was thought to be the same subspecies. Mitochondrial DNA is not near as complete. And mitochondrial DNA, if you get into genetics, uh, if you remember from G the Bio 340, it's, it's usually the, it's, it's a historical way of doing genetics because it was the easiest to get to. Nuclear DNA takes a lot more technology, uh, but it's pretty easy for people to do now. Uh, so they started looking at the nuclear DNA um, in a total of uh, about almost 1,800 nucleotides from four different genes to look at savanna and forest elephants. And what you see is Right away, they compared Asian elephants to African forest elephants to the savanna elephants. They really segregated themselves um, with these nuclear genes. And uh, forest elephants were more related to Asian elephants than they are African savanna elephants, which gives you a, again, here's the same thing. African forest and Asian are more related than the savanna as far as nucleotide divergence. Um, I don't want to have a genetics class here. 
uh, but just trust me on this. It's kind of like religion. You have to have faith that I'm telling you the truth. Uh, just like I have to have faith that I'm what I'm reading is the truth. Um, they're quite different. And, and that has severe conserva uh, conservation implications. Um, it, it certainly indicates there's been a real evolution um, for elephants in the forest versus savanna. Uh, and that management strategy should be based on two different species. And zoos should not be, in, and people in captive breeding should not be interbreeding these two types of, of African elephants. So that, that was important information to get. Clouded leopards, what a beautiful animal, right? Um, described subspecies, uh, Neophilus nebulosa, uh, not Panthera, Panthera pardus, like we talked about. The two subspecies uh, occurred on two different islands. Uh, they've been separated potentially for one million years. Um, these I that's water in this area of the world has gone up and down, up and down, up and down. There's a lot of speciation in that area because of that. They were able to get 109 samples from two of the four subspecies, uh, mostly from museums. They're very rare animals. They used a large number of markers, three mitochondrial DNA genes, 51 nuclear microsatellites, five nuclear DNA sequences, so more than the forest elephants, even though they had such a hard time. And then they looked at chromosome differences. And, then, and if you look at the mitochondrial, which is MT DNA, and the nuclear, which is the little n DNA, the microsatellites, this is probably the most intriguing example to look at here. Snow leopards, tigers, one of the subspecies of clouded leopards, leopard, jaguar, the other subspecies of clouded leopards. So this clouded leopard is not closely related to that clouded leopard at all. That's not a different subspecies. That is a different species. And then they looked at the chromosomal arrangement, which is how we did things historically, Look at the size and the amount of heterochromatin on the, the nebulosa subspecies versus the Ardei, much larger. That is not the same species. Uh, so there's a large genetic difference. These, these things have been separated for a long time, probably that million years. Uh, it's, they're equidistant from each other than lions and tigers are. So they're really different. Um, so there, there definitely is a new field species. Um, and in 2007, uh, they were able to look at clouded leopards in Sumatra, uh, and they were in the DRDI family, the DRDI species. This is one that I participated in, um, and this is looking at the phylogeography of pumas, uh, which mountain lions, jaguarundis, cheetahs, Siberian lynx. Uh, and this was done by a friend of mine, Melanie Culver. And uh, her objectives were to look at, uh, there was, uh, let me see here, I can't remember, 32 subspecies. 32 subspecies of mountain lions that have been described. Um, that's too many. And all of us know it. And what was happening in the 18, late 1800s, early 1900s, a scientist would go out and kill things. That's what we did. We went out and killed them, and we back, went back to the museum, and we made his measurement many measurements as possible. We looked for differences, 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 and they found them. Uh, and then to get published, they had to create a new subspecies, and that's what we've got. So we've got all these 32 subspecies. Uh, are there different physical ecological barriers? You can determine that from looking at genetics. Are they isolated by distance? Um, how is the current genetic variation? Uh, do they have a bottleneck like cheetahs do? Um, have there been historic migrations? Have there been historic bottlenecks uh, or historic dispersals? So Melanie was able to get 30, 315 samples from the 32 subspecies. If you look at all those around the Arizona, California area, that was, those were mine. I'll take samples from that. Um, I collected the blood or, or the tissue from that, from lions that we caught. Uh, and she used mitochondrial DNA, uh, three different genes, nuclear mac microsatellites, 10 loci, um, to look at population subdivision and infer historical demographic events. Now what she found here, and I know these tables are really scary looking, but look at the top and you have the North American subspecies and then you have the South American subspecies. You have the N, which is, that's the number of samples, okay? 
look at North America, all within the same group except for this one, which is Olympicus, which is out on Vancouver Island. All the other ones from South America, uh, Brown Eye were the ones that, that I collected, all the same. Um, look at South America, one, two, three, four, five, six, looks like seven different segregations. And this is just mitochondrial DNA, not the, the nuclear. All right, here in North America, again, one, two different groups uh, in nuclear DNA. Uh, then Central America kind of separated itself out. Eastern South America kind of separated itself out. Northern South America did. Central South America and then Southern South America. So the nuclear DNA um, was much more revealing than the, and, and then this figure, uh, you can see North America, all very similar. Southern South America, Central, so, uh, Eastern, Central, uh, and Central America kind of broke themselves out. Same six groups. Here's some really advanced statistics that goes into genetic analysis way more than we want to deal with right now, uh, same six groups. So what she was able to come up with is there's really only one subspecies in North America. Uh, there's an Eastern South America, there's a Central South American, and a Southern South America, potentially is a Central American subspecies. Uh, so there's only six groups, not 632. Uh, major restriction to Jane flow was the Amazon River and, and Rio Piranha and Rio Negro. Uh, and the ancestral haplotype, meaning where lions probably evolved from, was in Brazilian highlands. Uh, the land bridge between North and South America formed two, three million years ago. Melanie's estimating that the first cougar probably originated about 300,000 years ago. Um, and so there's been a couple radiations from South America to North America. She does believe that there's a indication of a bottleneck historically in North America, although mountain lions are doing really, really well in North America. Um, there has been a possible extirpation and then recolonization uh, in North America. The molecular data supports six real subspecies, not 32. Uh, pumas are fairly panmictic, meaning they mix well. Uh, management. Uh, should consider the effects of bottleneck populations like the Florida panther. This is where this stuff is kind of important, and, and this is what I was involved in, is this Yuma puma. Uh, that was Felis concolor brown eye, and that was described as a species in 1903, subspecies in 1903, and what they were were Colorado River mountain lions, and if that was a real subspecies, then that group is endangered. There are not many lions along the Colorado River. Uh, excuse me, I call them lions, not pumas. So when Melanie able came up with this, that could have had significant changes on how that area is, is, is used. Um, Melanie was able to show us that no, this not, they're not that significantly different. They should just be managed as a low population, not as an endangered subspecies. Same thing goes, now this is probably much more important, as far as, as something that was done to actually improve the population, the Florida panther. Uh, there are mountain lions in Florida. They're the only ones but left in the east, although they used to cover all of the east, and they're going back. Um, and the Florida panthers, they knew, were extremely inbred, extremely inbred, um, only 40 to 50 animals. It's very easy to take pumas from the west, and move them to Florida. But nobody wanted to do that because they were considered different subspecies and no one really wants to play God and mess with genetics because evolution created the genetic pool and we have a potential of really screwing things up if we start misking, missing, mixing groups that were really different. Um, however, once you showed that they were absolutely no different, they went and put a bunch of Texas mountain lions in there they instantly interbred. All of a sudden, your genetic heterozygosity is way up, and now you've got pumas moving from Florida into Georgia uh, and Alabama uh, and Mississippi. So they're doing really well. 
Uh, and but no one was. We were all afraid to do that um, until that day. So it's it's very, very possible. Uh, very very good information to have. This one I thought would interest you since we're going to see some lions. Uh, and this is lion kinship, paternity, and behavior. Another type of genetic diversity. Uh, lions live in these really complex social groups. Uh, and they determine kinship and paternity for 78 cubs within 11 different prides and looked at the level of inbreeding. Um, they found that females of prides are all closely related in those 11 prides, that the males were either closely related or unrelated, which is interesting, so some of them were closely related. Mating partners are usually unrelated, but there, which results in low level of inbreeding, but there was some breeding in between. So there is a potential for inbreeding within a lion pride. Uh, it is lower if the member of a large and closely related coalition. So some males act as non-reproductive helpers. So there are males, may have three males. Uh, they're not related, uh, uh, but they're usually, the males are relate, usually related. And some of those males may never breed. They let, they let their brothers breed. Um, it's, the inbreeding is higher in the small and unrelated coalitions. Um, and so reproductive strategy, they have a good strategy to avoid inbreeding. Um, and this is a, one that shows that they were able to identify animals just by using SCAT. So genetic diversity is, is really important. So let's move on to organismal diversity. We start talking about diversity and we start going into prokaryotes, we're going to overwhelm everyone in the world. Right now, there's 4 to 6 times 10 to the 30th. 10 to the 30th, that's 30 zeros. Many millions more times than there are cells, um, or, there, or there are stars visible in the universe. Uh, they produce about 1.7 times 10 to the 30th cells per annum. Uh, there's no estimate of how many species of prokaryotes there are. There may be an estimate of, of 10,000 to 1 million individuals within a per square species and maybe 1,000 to 10,000 species in a square meter of dirt. So um, that, you know, so if you're going to have a tropical forest, go get a shovel. You can have a lot of biodiversity. Um, impoverished avid even impoverished habitats have uh, 10,000 individual nematodes per meter squared. More productive have millions per meter squared. Um, 10 to 19th, zero is a conservative effort. The global number of individuals are free living nematodes. Um, 25,000 species of nematodes have been described, but they, they estimate there's over a million. So all I'm all I'm trying to do is is point out that when we talk about diversity, we we're usually talking about, and for the rest of this, I'm going to talk about birds, and I'm going to talk about mammals, and I'm going to talk about uh, reptiles, I'm talking about vertebrates. But in a handful of tropical dirt, you're going to have a million organisms, maybe 10,000, 20,000 species. Um, for example, it, this amazed me when I read this that. There was a study on the human digestive system. They found 395 different bacterial species in the colon. 244 of them were new. This is done like three years ago. Uh, nine tropical trees, the number of bacteria species ranged from 95 to 671 per trees. Uh, it, the, the diversity then, when we start looking at protozoa, algae, is overwhelming. Um, Al plants, fungi, we know more about. Nematodes, we don't really know much about. The is, is number of described species, the highest is, is the arthropods. Um, and these are numbers are in thousands on this table that you're looking at. Um, so 101 million arthropod, no, 101,000 arthropod species. Uh, working figure is 4650. Um, so our, our total accuracy of estimating really how many species there are. New, new species are described at about 13,000 per year. 36 new species are described on average per day. Most of these are smaller than a pinhead. Uh, and 
but there's still large gaps, the open abyss, forest canopies, particularly in the tropics, ocean bottom. So what is biodiversity? Uh, let's look at a, a species richness. Uh, we talked about earlier, that's the number of species per unit area. Species abundance is the number of individuals per species per unit area. We talk about mammal sampling, we're going to be looking at species abundance. And then species diversity is the number of different species in a particular area weighted by some measure of abundance. Um, diversity to the public is number of species. To you and my, richness is number of species. Diversity also considers the abundance of each species within that area. We just, um, I talk about that in mammal sampling. Uh, I don't want to go over it too much more here, um, but just be aware. Biomass, uh, total bo body mass of an organism or the community, primary producti pro productivity is the amount of biomass that accumulates from photosynthesis over a different period of time. Uh, composition, the actual set of species that comprise a community. Um, if you look at about 200, 2 million recognized species, about half are insects, about 25% are represented by just beetles. Uh, estimated that there's 8.7 million species, but there's some people who really disagree with that, that it's much, much higher, especially when you get into prokaryotes. Um, about 10,000 new species found every year, mostly insects and invertebrates. New vertebrate species are still being discovered, about one to five birds and about one to five mammals per year. It's a monkey that was just described in the last couple of years, uh, until 2007. Uh, a lot of people knew about it, just no scientists did. Uh, this is a pine tree that's in Australia. There's less than 100 trees, but it was discovered in 1994. So there's still some species out there. Then biologists look at scales of different biodiversity. Um, alpha diversity is, is just how, what's the species biodiversity within a patch. Beta diversity is the change or turnover in species composition between two distinct communities. Uh, gamma is the total species richness over a large geographic area such as biome, continent, or ocean basin. I actually don't, this is in the book, and I, but I don't see a tremendous use of these terms. Usually diversity is an index of the richness and the, even, and the abundance or evenness uh, of that community. So here is, this is beta diversity, which is the number of species and is a change between the different um, and so there's 3,836 3, bird species in our hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere. You can see that the highest number of beta diversity is in South America and Central America. We've got, Arizona does pretty good for itself, doesn't it? Um, and then some of the grasslands are gonna be uh, lesser agricultural areas, the uh, Tiaga, uh, our boreal forest doesn't have a lot. It's all about the tropics when it comes to birds. Lower latitudes also have a much larger number of species, marine, freshwater, terrestrial, microbes, plants, and vertebrates, vertebrates uh, both in small areas and all across the landscape. And uh, sometimes it's even a little stronger as you move a little away from the equator. Uh, so if you look at amphibians, um, you can see that as you get close to the equator, the number of species is much larger. Um, and that is found throughout the world. Uh, and biologists have tried to explain that since the 1700s. Um, first explanation was Forrester who thought it was high heat intensity in the tropics. Uh, Wallace pointed out that as you go north, you get more hostile weather and it's difficult. Uh, a lot of research has been uh, aimed at explaining this period. Um, the topic was the 25 key research themes of the future in science. And people are still trying to figure out why animal species diversity is so high in the, in the tropics or, or around the equator. I think these are the two best explanations. Um, the tropics are older. Uh, they're a much older biome um, than coniferous forest. Uh, so there's been more time for speciation uh, and lower extinction rates. And the tropics are also more productive. 
I mean, there's always food available, and which allows for species to become specialist. Uh, and they don't have to have, they don't have to disperse, they don't have to move as much. And those two reasons together, I think, uh, at least for me, seem to, to satisfy my curiosity. There is some uh, elevational gradients as well. Species richness tends to increase with elevation until a central set. Uh, but once you get over about 3,000 meters, then it starts to decline. But a lot of this is due to the amount of birds in South America and mammals in South America and butterflies in South America as you go up and get into those cloud forests. Um, environmental factors are temperature, air pressure, and precipitation. Precipitation goes up as you go up in altitude, and that's going to have a, if you have more productivity, you're going to have more animal species. Um, and there's never going to be one silver bullet answer. Biologists in nature they tend to, to look for the answer. Um, I don't believe in silver bullets. I believe in silver buckshot. So you're not going to find one thing that explains like why species are more diverse in one area than the other. There's probably going to be several different explanations uh, and you have to keep an open mind and look at all of them. There's a peninsula effect. Um, your species richness decreases as you move to the uh, tip of the peninsula. Uh, it's a smaller area, higher extinction, less likely to immigrate. Uh, animals are less likely to immigrate. Okay, let's look at ecological diversity. Um, populations, habitats, ecosystems, ecoregions, bio Mapping schemes have developed uh, 867 terrestrial, 426 freshwater, 232 marine ecoregions. We're going to recognize 14 terrestrial biomes. There's a lot more than that. Eight biogeographical realms. Um, Four broad oceans, polar, westerlies, trades, coastal boundaries. Here are biogeographic realms, Australasia, Oceania, Indomalaya, which is also called Asian, uh, Afro, um, and I can't read this, this is Neotropic, luckily I know that, and the Arctic, which is North America. Uh, and then these are all the different vegetation types uh, that are found in those different these are really biogeographic realms, meaning we're looking at the biology in these areas based on their geography. Um, most common measures are, again, numbers of species, which is richness, evenness, and diversity in deceased. Um, I'm going to skip over this history of biogeography, but I, I do want you to be aware that We've had extinction crises going on for quite a while, but never to the rate that's going on now. Uh, this is interesting. This shows, I mean, marine invertebrates, mollusks, snails, uh, are really make really good fossils because they're in sedimentary uh, rock, and and it's hard, it's easy to for a, a shell to uh, fossilize. You can see that there's been these number of genera gone from 200 to 600 back down to 200. So there's been these extinction crises before uh, and up to 95% of certain taxa types went extinct. Um, and then there's hot spots and troughs and that's what your reading assignment is going to be on. It's going to be pretty, you're going to have four different papers to read and, and answer some questions on it. Um, and I mean, you can find areas with incredible biodiversity or species richness. 900 species of fungi recorded in 13 plots near Austria. 173 species of lichens on one tree in New Guinea. 814 species of trees from the 50 hectare plot in Malaysia. 850 species of invertebrates at a North Sea beach. 245 resident species of birds uh, holding territories in a about a 100 hectare plot in Peru and greater than 200 species of mammals and some sites in the Amazon rainforest. So, now here we're going to look at the different vertebrate groups and we're looking at the different biogeographic areas. We've got the Afrotopret, which is Africa, Indomalaya, which again is primarily Asia, the Arctic, which is south, uh, which is us, and then Neotropic, okay. Let's look at the areas that have the highest richness and highest biodiversity evenness of amphibians, reptiles, birds, mammals. Neotropic. 
neotropic, Indo-Malaysian, neotropic, 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 Indo-Malaysian, North America, we finally made it, the Arctic, um, African, neotropic, 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 um, African again, neotropic, Africa, Africa, neotropic, neotropic. Is there a trend there? Neotropic, where is that again? That is Central and South America. That's where the majority of biodiversity is in the world. Uh, that's where the no most number of highest species are, most number of endemic uh, animals, um, which you'll learn about in a future lecture. And uh, the neotropics, Central and South America, are unbelievable, uh, the, the biodiversity there. This is total numbers of amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptile vascular species by country. Brazil is the leader. Colombia is next. Then China, which is 20,000 lower than Colombia and Brazil. Uh, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa, not doing bad where we're going. Venezuela, and these are insects. I mean, this is huge numbers of groups. Ecuador and the U.S. is not bad, but it's a large large uh, group, large country. Um, if you look at total species richness, okay, well now we're looking at just total numbers of birds. Neotropics, uh, very, very high. Uh, rare species, neotropics, very, very high. Some areas of Africa, the tropics in Southeast Asia. Threatened species richness, again, very high in South America. Uh, Africa, Southeast Asia. Mammals, you're seeing that same trend. And amphibians, again, you're seeing the same trend. Not many, near as many amphibians uh, uh, in Africa, though. Countries by number of bird species. This is a small country, but Colombia is, has the highest number of bird species. Peru is second. Brazil is third. Colombia and Peru are small. Uh, Let's see, I, excuse me, I have to put my glasses on here to read this. Indonesia, Ecuador, Bolivia, Venezuela, China. You get that real neotropic influence, don't you? Um, the relative richness of terrestrial mammal species. Um, again, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, China, U.S. We have quite a few mammal species. Colombia, Peru, uh, they're there. Colombia and Peru are high in everything. Um, this is endemicism. Endemic means the mammals are only found on that particular biogeographic region. We have two endemic mammals in North America. We have, um, Africa has several, but they're almost all on Madagascar, except for things like hippos. Uh, but the uh, uh, mammals in the, in the U.S. are, uh, are pronghorn, antelope capridae. And we have a mountain beaver, which is found up in the Pacific Northwest. Those are our two endemic species. That means they're not found anywhere else in the world but North America. What you're going to be reading about, though, is biologists are trying to determine, they're trying to, we've got a limited amount of conservation funds. It's not infinite. And so they're trying to define and identify the areas that those conservation dollars would be best spent. So they're looking at species richness, which is this number of species, number of endemic species, number of threatened species, a combination, some different math formula. You're going to read all about this. So it, it's very interesting, um, and, and this is just a list of a number of reptiles is highest in Australia, but Mexico second. Number of vascular plant is highest in Brazil, second is Colombia, again, a small country. 20,000 ahead of China, Brazil, Colombia. Think about how many plants there are or amphibians that haven't been described in those really isolated areas, too. Um, oceans is way behind. Oceans cover 67% of the Earth. However, only 15% of described species are marine and only 6% freshwater. I think you can figure out why. It's hard to work there. If you're a human, it's hard to get in underwater. Um, some key constraints on speciation and, and extinction rates. Uh, productive energy certainly influences number of species. 
ambient energy, which influences mutation and speciation rate, climatic variation, uh, influences physiological tolerances. If there's a lot of climatic variation, it's difficult for a species to evolve the abilities to, to survive there. Uh, evolution, natural selection is random. Um, we'll talk about the giraffes in Africa, and that's why there's not long-necked animals anywhere else. Topographic variation um, causes population to become more isolated, therefore uh, you could have more inner species and you could have a higher amount of extinction. Um, this is important to me uh, and because I went through school and my heroes were, were naturalists. And these were people who went out and described what was there and they did the basic life history, what they ate, uh, what temperatures they can endure, etc. And I've been in there as a researcher and a publisher since 1980. Uh, and I've seen a push where everything has to be experimental design. It's still real prominent in academia, which is where I'm sitting right now and where you're sitting. Everything has to be an experimental design, it has to be really creative, great research. Sometimes people just going out and documenting what's there is incredibly important. And I'm, I'm very glad to see that people now involved uh, who've been basically theoretical ecologists and they're trying to uh, take in their theories and apply it to conservation are, are admitting that the people who go out and do species inventories are creating treasure trove. You've got to know what was there and you've got to know what was there in the past to have any idea of how to conserve an area. In an area like Singapore, uh, the worst case scenario in tropical deforestation, 95% of its primary forest was lost by 1819. Uh, fortunately, there were some good inventories. Uh, they could determine loss in vascular plants, crustaceans, phasmids, butterflies, fish, amphibians, reptiles. They found that 28% of the original species were lost due to deforestation. Extinctions were highest in butterflies, fish, birds, and mammals. And when you read about Madagascar uh, this week, you'll, you'll see some similarities there. Uh, due to low endemicism in, in, in Singapore, all these extinctions likely represented populations than species extinction. Remember what endemic means, it means they are only found there. So a lot of these species are found in other countries. Um, and using extinction data from Singapore also projected if current levels of, south, of levels of deforestation in Southeast Asia continue, we could lose 13 to 42 percent of regional populations by 2100, and half could be all, not just different populations, but that whole species goes extinct. And that's vertebrates primarily, and, and that's scary. So you've got four papers to read on how scientists are, it's just a, a small introduction to biodiversity, but you're gonna read four papers on how scientists are, are arguing, uh, we argue a lot, uh, and trying to create the, and determine the best areas to uh, preserve based on different biodiversity indices. Um, and, and I think you'll enjoy it and, and learn quite a bit out of it. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye-bye.